This is an award-winning mathematician. He has spent much of his research trying to answer the question, why does coffee brew? And the answer is probably not what you think. He didn't ask this question due to some deep everlasting love for coffee. No, he asked the question because answering it solves a lot more than just coffee. The way rumors circulate or how diseases spread or even how forest fires propagate. All of these systems can be modeled in the same way as coffee brewing. So let's discuss it. Coffee is magnificent. It is a fundamental component of many of our lives. And this makes a lot of sense. Not only does it give it us a lot of energy, but it also has an amazing breadth of flavors, giving us so much variety if we want it. Studies have shown that people can identify various flavors from nine categories, vegetative and green, floral, nutty and cocoa, roasted, sweet, spices, fruity, sour and fermented, and others. But brewing is complex and depends on many different factors. How much of the coffee is extracted can change the flavor of the same coffee from being a sour and acidic drink to something that is more bitter and dry. This can depend on the grind size of the beans, which should be tailored to the method that you're trying to use. Methods that have a shorter water to bean contact time often require a finer grain, think espresso, while methods that have a longer contact time require larger grind sizes, for example, cold brew. The temperature of the water should also change depending on the roasts of the beans, warmer for lighter roasts, and even the exact makeup of the water that you use matters. Are you using really hard water with lots of calcium in it to stop freezing in cold countries? Or soft water with sodium and salt in it? It all matters. But here is something else that you may have never thought about. How does water even move through coffee to begin with? Understanding the maths behind it is important, not only just for coffee, but for many other problems. But it has not been an easy task to understand. It basically comes down to answering the question, how does water move through a porous material? A porous material is something that contains a lot of voids in it, which can be filled with gases or liquids. And there are actually a lot of porous materials around us. Sponges, cork, bone, even cement are all porous. And porous materials are so useful. They maximize surface area and can flow and interact with fluids in a way that is extremely advantageous. As a consequence, there are so many applications for these materials, from energy storage to improving construction materials. So clearly, it is important to understand how fluids move through these porous materials. This process is called percolation. This is a different problem from many other problems that we face in science. Basically, we already know the answer. Coffee does brew. The water moves through it and it wets all of the beans. But we don't know how to describe why. Well, that is until now. We can describe percolation with a grid of nodes that are connected with lines. This is called a graph. Then to describe the movement of the liquid through these graphs, we trace possible paths. At each path, a coin is flipped to determine whether the path is open or closed. The probability of this coin flip makes a huge difference, but more on that soon. By iteratively going through, eventually all of the paths have been decided and there are a series of paths through the graph. So you may have noticed that there's a few points that are only connected to themselves. This is a closed system and it's a finite cluster. This works in the sense that if this region gets wet, it doesn't wet other regions. So say I take some coffee grounds and I wet them. What happens is that it wets only a small region. What happens is it doesn't matter how much water I put into this system. I can absolutely drench it in water and it will still say exactly the same. The 
water won't spread because there's no path for it to spread. Now, obviously, this is not how coffee works. If I do wet the beans more, it obviously spreads throughout. So therefore, this type of system doesn't accurately represent the coffee itself. And this is what I mean by saying that the probability of a coin flip in deciding the path is open or closed makes a big difference. Below some critical value, water can't spread through the whole system. Nor can it travel through the material, that is, from one side of the graph to the other. But as the probability of the paths being marked as open increases, a phase transition occurs, and all of a sudden, it can. But why is this important? Well, the question really is, can we fundamentally control this behavior? Can we engineer systems that can be switched from a flowing state to a non-flowing state? But in order to do this, we need to understand the maths behind it so that we can know exactly what we're looking for. Explaining these types of phase transitions and mathematically defining the maximum number of unique paths through the percolation graph was some of the contributions that were made that led to the Fields Medal being awarded. It is extremely important to understand these transitions because we are not just talking about coffee anymore. It turns out that many things can be described by this model. And as a consequence, it has broad applications. In fact, Professor Hugo is quite interested in using these graphs to try and understand the way magnetism works in more exotic magnetic systems. Awards like this represent great contributions to science. Another prestigious award is the Nobel Prize, which the Physics Medal was recently given for climate change research and modeling. Check out this video if you want to know more. Thanks for watching, have fun, and see you next time.